So thank you, Kathy and Tom and all the other folks at the um, Foundation for organizing this meeting. It's been great so far, and I look forward to the rest of the day. Um, I will be talking about um, pH dynamics in Alzheimer's disease. But uh, first things first, I want to make it very clear that I'm up here representing a team um, consisting of myself, um, Diane Barber, Torsten Whitman, and Matt Jacobson, who's also here. As you can see, we're a fairly multidisciplinary team, and I think that was part of the genius of this RFA of getting someone who's been involved in Alzheimer's disease research myself, um, collaborating with um, a bunch of folks who've never worked in Alzheimer's disease. And it's been really, really fun. And we have a great group of um, postdoctoral fellows um, who are the ones who are responsible for the work that you're going to see. So um, I showed this actually in our meeting in February. So we got called a bunch of crazy people um, uh, when we were given this grant. And in fact, um, in this particular article, our group was pointed out as being among the craziest of the crazies. And I thought that was great because um, who doesn't want to be called crazy? Um, and then a few months later, I was walking through our local um, grocery store wearing my badge of insanity. And what did I come across but this? Pheno, which is pH hydroxyl, and it's the intelligent alkaline hydration. So I thought it was fascinating that we went from sort of the fringes of science to commercial success within less than eight months. Um, but as you can see, um, what they're focusing on here is actually alkaline hydration, and we don't actually think that just being more alkaline is um, the key. So um, what are neurodegenerative diseases? Well, some people um, think they are clearly diseases of aging. Um, and in fact, we think of them primarily as um, diseases of uh, failed protein homeostasis or proteostasis. And that's because, um, with no exceptions, these diseases show protein aggregates being deposited in the brain. They are different depending on the disease, and they're quite different in terms of their localization. All sort of mysteries um, that need to be solved in terms of what are the causes. Um, however, what it suggests to us, actually, is that um, with aging, the ability of a cell to maintain its proteostasis is becoming more and more challenged, and with an additional insult, such as a gene mutation that doesn't present until age 60 or 70, or with um, a surgery that causes inflammation, or with repetitive concussions that come from playing sports, um, a, a cell is pushed kind of over the knife's edge into um, this disease state. And what most people don't think about in terms of aging, and I think um, it's where the novelty of our um, proposal came from, is that there are changes that happen in the um, hydrogen ion regulation in cells with age. And just so that we're all on the same page, um, neutral pH, as we all know, is pH 7. It's an equal balance of protons and hydroxide ions. And if you go even one pH unit away from that, on either side, you, you're changing the um, proton concentration by about tenfold. And that's really interesting because in a cell, um, there is a vast range of uh, pH set points. And in fact, these pH set points actually define the functions of the particular cellular compartment, and um, they are fundamentally important for the function of that compartment. So for example, you can see that um, the mitochondria has a pH of 8, and um, in the cytosol, the pH is about it's close to neutral, about 7.2, but then as the um, endolysosomal system becomes um, acidified, you actually get down to a pH of about 4.7. So between the lysosome and the mitochondria, you're getting a 10,000-fold difference in the number of, of the concentration of hydrogen ions. And you could imagine that, um, you don't have to imagine this, it's true, um, hydrogen ions can act just like any other post-translational modification, like acetylation or phosphorylation. And it has fundamental effects upon protein structure, folding, interactions, localization, and downstream effects upon cell function. Um, so we came to this because of some um, work that had been in the field um, by people and folks in our group, actually. Um, so at homeostasis, I already told you, PHI, or the intracellular pH, is about 7.2, while the lysosomal pH is, is fairly acidic, less than 5. And what Diane and Matt had shown um, previously, along with um, many others, is that in cancer, which is an excessive cell proliferation, the cytosolic pH actually goes up slightly, while um, lysosomal pH can, uh, can go down. And um, then other work by Dan Kochling's group showed that in aging, the lysosomal pH actually decreases. And um, in, um, in addition, synaptic function actually can change um, local pH as well. So there was some work from um, 
um, Randy Nixon's lab, um, primarily in uh, PS1 mut mutant um, Alzheimer's disease, that the lysosomal pH is um, inadequately acidified. And stress and cell death can actually lower intracellular pH. So, um, uh, it, so it's clear that in a number of disease states, and in fact in opposite disease states, the pH changes are different. They're um, uh, uh, completely separate. So um, this was out there, and then working separately, um, our groups actually came up with some interesting sort of preliminary data. So in my group, we are working on um, a cleavage product of progranulin called granulins. I'll tell you a little bit more about later. But suffice it to say, we found that if we express granulins, we could change the morphology of the lysosome as well as the pH of the lysosome became lower. And then Diane's group, working independently, um, uh, kind of debunked a thought in the field, which is that cytosolic pH decreases, becomes more acidic in the cytosol, um, as a result of cell death. But what she did is she knocked out the cell death molecules in a cell line and showed that pH in response to stress goes down. So armed with this sort of preliminary data, we came up with a hypothesis that pH dysregulation can actually promote neurodegeneration by impairing protein clearance and promoting protein aggregation. And um, based on this, we had three sort of uh, basic questions we wanted to ask. How do PHI and pH lysosome affect proteostasis? Do age-related changes um, in different cellular compartments actually promote neurodegeneration? And are PHI and pH lysosome jointly regulated? Um, ambitious goals, and we uh, have made um, really good progress. And I'll tell you about a little bit of what we have, um, have found. Uh, so as it turns out, um, when we started this, so we um, realized very quickly we would need tools for measuring pH and we would need tools for manipulating pH. And um, there were certain tools that were out there, and then we very quickly realized that many of them were inadequate, um, and so we would have to generate our own. And so one of the tools that's out there is, um, that works very well is a genetically encoded um, pH sensor, um, a, a ratiometric version of a florin that came from Jero Miesenbach um, uh, and Jim Rothman when he was in his lab. And this allows us to look, use different wavelengths of light to um, activate a fluorescent protein, a GFP that actually had been mutated. Um, and it reacts differently at different wavelengths. And we can figure out a ratio of the um, pH. Um, uh, sorry, a ratio of the fluorescence to, that will tell us pH. So there was no such genetically encoded um, lysosomal pH sensor. There were these vital dyes that work okay for cell culture, but once you get into a multicellular organism, um, they, they just don't work well. And so we realized we had to de develop a novel lysosomal pH sensor. And we've been through many, many um, generations of this already. We have finally settled upon um, a sapphire version of GFP that seems to have the perfect pK, that doesn't aggregate, that expresses well, um, that is bright enough. Um, and with that, then this is a new version compared to what we talked about in um, February. You can show, um, we've shown that at different pHs, we see very different fluorescences. And now we can begin to put this into cells, for example, C. elegans that age normally versus C. elegans that um, have a mutation that allow them to live twice as long or rapidly aging animals. And we'll be able to really understand the fundamental changes that occur with aging that may contribute to impaired proteostasis um, and neurodegeneration. So um, that's measuring. What about manipulating? So um, manipulating PHI and pH, lysosome, uh, pH in the lysosome is a little bit more challenging, but there are ways to do this that we've taken advantage of. And um, one of these is to look, um, just to change the buffer with um, ammonium chloride. And actually, I don't know if you can make this um, movie play, but uh, you can see that when you add ammonium chloride, the fluorescence goes way up, and then it comes um, back down. Uh, this is with a vital dye. So increasing cytosolic pH um, can be done this way. And then decreasing cytosolic pH, you can use a, a membrane permeant dye called 6NVA. And it's a caged uh, proton donor that's activated with blue light. And if you give flashes of blue light, you can control the pH, make it more acidic in a temporal and spatially specific fa uh, fashion. And then in terms of lysosomal pH, once again, it's relatively easy to alkalinize a uh, lysosome um, with um, drugs, uh, various VATPase inhibitors that prevent the influx of protons into the lysosome. Um, making the lysosome more acidic actually is um, quite challenging. And what we're working on now is uh, one method to prevent proton leak. Um, and if you do this, you can actually acidify the lysosome. Um, and that's with a, a type of um, knocking down a type of channel called TRIPML. Okay, oops, great. So um, 
what have we found? So one of the really interesting things we found recently has to do with tau and binding to microtubules. So tau, as we all know, is a, is a microtubule binding protein that um, its true function is actually not known. It's amazing, actually. We've been studying it for 20, 30 years, and we still don't know what it actually does. One of the things it does is it cycles on and off microtubules in a way that's also not understood at all. Some people thought it was due to phosphorylation, um, but um, um, I, I actually personally think that's unlikely. But if tau um, is uh, seeded, it can then form these um, uh, tau tangles. So what um, Diane and uh, Torsten did is they looked at um, a fluorescent version of tau um, in these um, RPE cells, and they just simply changed the pH from um, physiological, 7.4, to just three-tenths of a unit higher. And what she found is, amazingly, that the um, tau completely almost falls off of microtubes. as you can see right there. Um, and then if you reverse it back to pH 7.4, it will jump back on. Um, this is fascinating. Nobody has ever shown a pH-dependent change in tau microtubule binding. And we have some preliminary data that we can actually um, pinpoint the residues that are important. So it turns out that histidines and cysteines have a pKa closest to physiological pH. And, if you, and, and the microtubule binding domain of tau has these four invariant histidines. If we mutate that, we seem to be able to um, uh, abolish this pH dependent change in microtubule binding. So as you can imagine, there are all kinds of interesting follow-up questions that we can ask, um, and we'll certainly be working hard on that over the next year. In addition, um, I, I told you that I'd come back to this. Um, we've been very interested in a molecule called progranulin that is mutated in familial forms of FTLD. And um, it also um, has some um, allelic variants that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. And progranulin is interesting because it's a loss of function that's associated with disease. It's also interesting because the dosage of it is incredibly important. So if you get too much progranulin, it actually promotes tumor growth and metastases. If you have half as much as a normal amount of progranulin, you get neurodegenerative disease. And if you have no progranulin, you actually get a lysosomal storage disease called neuronal ceroid lipofusinosis. And this is one of several um, new links between juvenile onset lysosomal storage diseases and adult onset um, neurodegeneration, which suggests sort of this very important um, uh, role that the lysosome is playing in controlling protein homeostasis and sort of recycling um, the cell's constituents um, for reuse. So in work that I don't have time to show you, um, uh, we showed that both age and stress can uh, promote the cleavage of progranulin to this um, cleaved uh, uh, fragment known as granulins, that the granulins are actually toxic and that they seem to specifically affect the degradation of a molecule known as TDP43, but it does not actually affect tau, suggesting an interesting specificity in terms of the function of the granulins. And that overall, progranulin seems to be able to promote a cell's ability to resist environmental mental stress, where the granulins impair it. And so they are doing basically opposite, opposite things to a cell in terms of its, um, in terms of its ability to, to uh, respond to stress. Um, so we were a little bit confounded in terms of what um, the granules were actually doing. We knew that they're produced in the lysosomes. They're doing something there. We had all this data um, linking it um, genetically to an, an aspartyl protease known as ASP3 that we'd actually pulled down um, in an unbiased fashion from an uh, IP. And then at this point, um, we were able to... Um, Ashley, could you play this movie as well? Um, we were able to work with Matt to do, and a postdoc in his lab, Olivia Pierce, to do this molecular dynamic modeling. And it turns out that um, granulins seem to sit right in the active site of this aspartyl protease. Its, it's closest um, relative is cathepsin D, which actually has been implicated in um, Alzheimer's disease um, as well. And it, um, based on the functional data that we have, it would make sense that the granulins actually are sitting in this active site and preventing cathepsin D from doing its work. And we have uh, lots of other sort of specificity data, but just to show you two other closely related um, aspartyl proteases, ASP1 and 4, um, the interaction with granulin is not nearly as um, tight. And um, then we looked in C. elegans, we looked at ASP3 slash cathepsin D activity, and lo and behold, if you express any of the C. elegans granulins, um, you can inhibit the normal... Um, 
uh, stress-associated increase in cathepsin D activity. This is a normal wild-type increase, and if you express any of the cathepsins, you um, lose that age-associated, excuse me, that heat stress-associated um, uh, increase in cathepsin D activity. And this is really exciting because um, there are a number of um, cathepsins in the lysosome. They come in different sort of flavors, serine, uh, proteases, cysteine proteases, and the aspartyl proteases like ASP3. There are known endogenous inhibitors of uh, uh, cysteine proteases, they're called cystatins, um, serine proteases, they're called serpents, but there, was, there has until now not been um, an aspartyl protease inhibitor. So we think that we found um, actually one of the first aspartyl protease inhibitors, which um, could lend actually specificity depending on what um, protease uh, a particular granulin is inhibiting. And as I mentioned before, there are a number now of diseases that um, implicate lysosomal function and autophagy. Um, as you can see, aging um, has effects upon the lysosome. And so we think we're um, getting closer to sort of understanding um, how changes in both cytosolic pH and lysosomal pH, which uh, uh, um, undoubtedly um, affect uh, 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 these cathepsins functions, um, can um, lead to or promote um, a neurodegenerative disease by impairing protein degradation in the cell. So with that, I just want to thank the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation um, for, I guess, taking a chance on us, and we um, look forward to um, updating you again next year on the progress that we've made. Questions? I hesitantly put up my hand, <laughs> but um, since there is time, how much or what is known about, if anything, about spatially, uh, spatial heterogeneity? You showed multiple compartments process pH and do things very differently. What about out at the synapse, maybe presynaptically? Mm -hmm. And what about up in the dendrites yeah. in various compartments? So we've had interesting discussions about this in our monthly meetings, um, and the diffusivity of, of a proton is so fast that, at, likely in a cell body, there is, there is, it would be difficult to generate islands of pH difference. But I think what you bring up about um, a, a, uh, an axon or a dendrite is slightly different. Um, Archaeorhodopsin, which is a tool that neuroscientists use to activate um, uh, neurons with light, actually changes the pH, um, and that's how it activates the cells. So one could imagine there, that there are activity-dependent changes in pH locally that could be affecting cow binding to microtubules, as, as well as a number of uh, additional downstream um, effects. So. So, how do you, I mean, given both the, uh, so, so given, the, you know, the, the prevalence of pH changes throughout the cell, and the extremely fast temporal dynamics and the equilibria thereof, how do you disentangle, I didn't get the, how you would disentangle cause from effect in, in uh, disease I progression. Yeah, I mean, yes, so pH can change, but that could be. So we'll be able to do uh, two different things. One is we can, for example, take C. elegans where we know they, they age faster or they age slower, and we can actually monitor what the changes are in, this, in different compartments, the cytosol and the lysosome. But on top of that, we can manipulate um, pH, and then we can look and see what's the half-life of tau, what's the half-life of TDP43. We can measure those with sort of optical pulse chase experiments. On top of that, we, like Jerome, have a, um, access to a number of um, patient cell lines, and we can also monitor in these um, cells that either are I neurons or differentiated via an IPS um, intermediate what happens to the different um, pH effects. So I think there's a number of ways to address that. Can you control pH in these aging neurons then and show that Yes. Yes. And that's why it was so important to get um, genetically uh, um, encoded lysosomal pH sensors so that we can actually watch this happen and then we can manipulate um, the different compartments. Probably not independently, but um, to some extent um, we'll be able to know what's happening where.